Um, my name is Sarah Phillips. I'm one of the curriculum managers in the MYP development team at the IB office in The Hague. I'm Nicole Bean. I met many of you throughout the last two days. I'm head of uh, MYP and PYP program. All right, and I think this is working too. Look at that. All right, our goals for today are to uh, give you an overview of, the, of what's happening with MYP e-assessment, um, and then really to focus on the implications of those findings in terms of teaching and learning. And ideally, we'll have a chance to connect with uh, the people in the room to share best practices and experiences and ask and answer some of the questions that we have. Um, so to get a sense of who all is in the room, um, if you could smile and wave at the people um, to let us know where you've traveled from. So who has, who is from here in Jordan? Smile and wave. Oh. Uh, Everybody, awesome. I come from way in the outer circle. Um, I, although I'm working in, the, uh, in Europe at the moment, I'm from Canada originally. Um, Nicole's from all over the world. Um, good, who here are teachers? Primarily teachers, mostly. How about administrators, like principals or MYP coordinators? Um, board members, do we have any board members in the house? No. Uh, or curriculum developers working perhaps outside of schools or at a, at a district level from community partnerships or any other like teacher training institutes. Okay, good. Uh, so we're, m okay, good. Um, is there anyone who, here who's pretty new to IB? Everyone here. No, yeah. Lots of experience with IB? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, cool. Um, how about e-assessment? Lots of experience with e-assessment. Is there anyone who's, yeah. No, we are preaching to the choir, so to speak. That's <laughs> good, okay. Um, oh, sorry, the formatting seems to have gone a little bit strange, but you get the idea, e-assessment. Um, does anyone here, when I say next chapter, nod if you know what that means? Were you at MYP schools before 2014? Um, did any of you participate in moderation of assessment? Yeah, okay, so that's familiar, good. Um, okay, we're gonna race right through this. So we'll be able to spend more time with your questions, which is great. I think what would be important since all of you are doing the minority is would they believe the minority for you to do research and then This won't, this won't be news to anybody. Um, with the next chapter, we're looking to bring in um, a shared culminating experience for MYP students and an, a, a new way of getting that MYP certificate. Um, this is the timeline. So this project has been in the works since 2010 when we started to review the whole, um, the whole program, which it sounds like many of you were um, around in those days, if not actively a part of it, which is which is great. Um, here's what we offer currently. Um, personal project, of course, is mandatory for everybody. So all schools that have a year five engage in at least one part of our e-assessment. Then, of course, there's the e-portfolio, which is internally assessed, externally moderated tasks. And then we have some on-screen exams. Um, if you didn't attend the MYP update session or you haven't been reading the coordinator's notes, uh, you might not know yet that the language acquisition exam is going to be moving on screen. That will come with the revised curriculum that's launching in 2020, and that will be for first assessment in May of 2022. Uh, true, yes, there will be a spoken task that will be done in school and externally moderated. Yeah, that's right, thanks. Um, is it worth watching the video? We are probably skip it. You guys know that there's a video on the public website 
really useful, especially if you're trying to implement it, if you need to bring board members if you need to convince them that it's a good idea or convince parents that it's a good idea, those are useful links to, to be able to share. Um, this is one that I really wanted to dig into because certainly um, on my end of things, I, th I perceive a number of misconceptions about what this is about. So I think for a lot of schools, it, it can look like a digital version of a very traditional exam. Um, there's some really great affordances. As a math teacher, I love that they can ha you can include these simulations so students can do their investigations by quickly generating a set of data. You know, it adds these affordances like videos. You can provide more multimedia stimulus material for students to engage with. Of course, there's great accessibility features in terms of allowing students to type. You can embed the extra time if they need a visual more contrast. You can include all of those things. Those are all really nice features, but I don't think that's what makes this really, really innovative. Um, I think it's really important to remember that even though it can be perceived as a, as a fairly traditional end of program summative assessment, there's some very, very innovative things about it that have really significant implications for what we do as teachers in the classroom. Um, <coughs> I, I think a lot of teachers still believe that it's content driven. I see this in the IB answers queries that, that land on my desk. So for example, um, I've been asked more than once, is momentum on the science exam? And you know, I'm like, well, no. Like we, we have these topic lists that say forces in motion. And so it doesn't specify which things. And so I can understand why teachers would find that really frustrating because they want to prepare their students. But this is not an exam that is about a box of 100% content and we're measuring what percentage students know. This is about making sure that students have a solid foundation in the discipline and can apply that in an unfamiliar context. So the difference that makes for me as a science teacher is instead of saying, okay, I need to teach my students about velocity, about position, they need to know the momentum formula, they need to know X number of formulas. My job then as a teacher is they need to understand that these formulae are relationships in the physical world and that each variable represents a certain aspect or dimension that will have particular units so that when they see a new situation and they are provided with a formula sheet, so for example, they could say, okay, momentum is defined as this versus this and this is the formula. They have the prior experience to say, oh, okay, that's actually not unlike the acceleration formula or the velocity formula. I've used that before, and so I can apply that understanding to this new situation. So it really, sh it's, a, it's a subtle but significant shift from being about, you know, here's this list of content that students must know, and we're going to measure how much of it they know, to saying, here's some topics that they should understand and be able to apply that flexibly in new situations. That's one of the, to me, the really exciting things about this digital interface is you can provide students with quite a bit more information. Um, they just need to know what kinds of information they need to tackle these unfamiliar situations. Um, so again, that, that drives down to that second part where um, I remember myself as a high school student, you know, we would get <laughs> justifiably angry at the teacher. I'm like, but you didn't teach us how to do that in class. But that's not how MYP works, certainly in mathematics. We know from criterion A that to reach the highest level, you have to be able to apply and solve problems in an unfamiliar situation. So whereas I would have been super angry at my, you know, grade 10 math, but you didn't teach me how to do that. But did you, what I would tell my students is, I promise you, you have the skills. I know you haven't seen this before. Expect the unexpected, but trust me that you have the skills to do this. You're just going to have to take some risks, be brave, try something out. Um, it's gonna be okay, I promise you, you have the skills to do this. And think, exactly, exactly. Um, so it's, we now have, instead of just saying, okay, remember I modeled this for you in class yesterday, now you try it over here. It's saying, oh, here's an interesting situation. What do you know that might be useful in this scenario? And, and teach them to expect the unexpected and to be brave and to be thinkers in the face of that unfamiliarity. I think another significant difference is that whereas traditional exams are about recalling information, and, and you can push to that level of understanding, how well do they understand it? 
I think these MYP exams, because they do focus on transferable concepts, they focus on these unfamiliar situations, it really forces students to be able to transfer their understanding. And of course, as we heard in the plenary this morning, I mean, information is changing so rapidly. <laughs> What's the point of understanding 100% of stuff today? Because that's gonna be such a minuscule fraction of knowledge tomorrow or a year from now. So that ability to apply their understanding and transfer it to new situations is gonna be absolutely critical. So I think those are the things, you know, it, for all the flashy, nice digital interface and all, that, all those great affordances that come with that, um, it, that's not the best part of it, right? These are the best parts of it, is that you can prepare students for a future not just that's digitally mediated, but that they are equipped to transfer their understanding to more complex, less familiar situations. And I'll say, when I made the jump, I had been a moderator of assessment for mathematics, and then I was invited to become an examiner. And my first experience, I was <laughs> honestly a little bit horrified. I'm like, how, what? We've gone from these four objectives and criteria, which were really fantastic, to a, to a mark scheme? We're just count tallying up marks. Um, but as I actually engaged in the process, and I um, realized that, no, that's just, that's just the starting point because that does translate into a grade award process where you're looking at specific pieces of student work against the general grade descriptors to make sure that whatever level is awarded at the end is reflective of that qualitative descriptor. It's like, okay, that's completely different. That's much more philosophically aligned with what I experienced as a moderator. Later on, when I worked for the organization, I got to participate in an authoring meeting, and that just took it into another much deeper level, where at every single step, they're aligning each question, each prompt, each mark in the mark scheme with strands and objectives, and making sure it's completely balanced. So you can be sure that each of those on-screen exams is reflective of all of the objectives for the subject area. It is a really valid, really, really carefully thought out assessment. Um, and it has um, student understanding at its heart. At the, at the very end of the day, when it is time to do that great award, it is about looking for evidence of understanding, which was, was really exciting to me, especially when <laughs> I, um, was in a context where grade 10 or year 5 students also had to write uh, government exams, which were also on screen, <laughs> and they were horrible. It was multiple choice and drop down menus, and there was no, students could fail the exam because they didn't click well, and it was horrible, and then contrasted with this where it was really, I mean, as an examiner, I don't, is, are there other examiners in the, in the room that you know that it is not lucrative, it is time consuming, it is thoughtful, careful work. Looking for that evidence of student understanding is, it comes down to the heart of it at every step of the process. Um, so we're hearing from schools that there are the benefits of an opportunity to measure effective teaching against a global standard. That's what exams do, we're used to that. But remember, we've shifted that global standard for MYP. It's not just about how much content have students mastered, it's how deeply do they understand it and how effectively can they transfer it to an unfamiliar situation. Um, for teachers, this has certainly been true in my own practice. It has really pushed my assessment design. It has pushed me as um, a provider of formative feedback along the way. Because again, it's not just, can you repeat what I told you? It's about how well do you understand what's going on? It shifted me from just a measurer of output to uh, an inquirer into the student's thinking. If they've said something, why are they saying that? Is that evidence of a misunderstanding? How might I correct or refine that understanding? And what learning experience does a student need to push their understanding farther? 
And then of course, for students, it is much more about developing approaches to learning skills and just transferable subject-specific skills in general beyond just regurgitating facts, which again, <laughs> it's poor students. It's harder to fake this one, right? You can't just memorize something and say it back to the teacher and expect them to believe that you've understood it. They have to really understand it because they're going to have to be able to use it quite flexibly. Um, we've won awards, if you haven't heard. Um, so it's, it's nice, you know, we internally in the organization, we know that this is a really exciting, really innovative. It's nice that other people see it as well. Um, so we won best transformative project and best use of summative assessment, which was at the, I can't even, the e-assessment awards. Of I didn't even know that this existed, but we won the prize. Um, so here's some insight. If you were in the update session, you will have heard a little bit of this. Um, you can see our uptake is generally growing, um, both in on-screen exams and e-portfolios. Um, you might notice that e-portfolio is a slight drop at 9%. We think the reason for that is schools have realized that arts, design, and PHE you don't have to do all three to qualify for the certificate. There is flexibility there. So I think schools have decided to either to keep students' course load manageable to select one or two rather than all three, or even you know, keep them in those courses, but perhaps do fewer of the e-portfolio subjects. So I think that's why we're seeing a bit of that decline. Otherwise, we're seeing growth across subjects. Um, this is also useful. Of course, our colleagues in diploma have a long, long history of offering exams. Schools have a history of delivering them. They have a clear sense of what's expected and how to prepare students. Obviously, it's a learning curve for all of us in the MYP. You can see that our pass rate um, grew in between that first and second session, and now it's starting to level off, which is about what we'd expect, that we understand kind of what the standard is, that teachers and students are understanding what they need to do to be able to pass. Has anyone checked out the statistical bulletin available on the public website? Um, useful information, it gives lots of statistics. There's tons of bar graphs about the number of points for certificates and where, uh, yeah, so this is for May 2018. Yeah, it's fairly recently on the, on the public website. Um, I was really excited to see that almost half of our MYP certificates are bilingual certificates. I think that's really exciting. Um, did anyone complete the survey recently? There was a survey that was sent out to schools who participate in e-assessment beyond the personal project. Uh, so we are looking for some feedback from teachers in everything. We're always looking for feedback from teachers. Um, so getting some really nice comments um, about students feeling comfortable with the layout of the exam. Um, they like the options, the different, in, the different ways that they can interact, the different type of uh, stimulus material. You're not seeing any quotes from yourself, are you? <laughs> um, the interactivity, of course, is, is a really nice feature. You don't get that in a paper exam. It gives students a few more options in terms of how they communicate their understanding. Um, we did ask why schools chose to do this. Um, I won't read through all the options, but what, what my colleague, Eleanor, who is uh, the senior manager for e-assessment development and delivery, her, I thought her comment was really interesting, that there, there are those very traditional motivations for having that certification at the end, for having that um, standard of rigor, but there's also some really contemporary or innovative rationales for participating, just wanting to be part of this innovation, which I think is really exciting. Um, the, the focus on ATL and conceptual understanding. It's nice, nice to know that, that teachers are buying in for, for the reasons that we were, that we were hoping for. Um, in terms of school's experiences, we're also seeing uh, um, those traditional but as well as contemporary benefits. So the ability to apply their knowledge in unfamiliar contexts, um, that it's supporting teachers, helping them to understand what they should be doing in the classroom, having a nice media-rich environment. Actually, it's also a change in the way they're teaching them. Yeah? The assessment in my hands, like, what is the impact that has on teachers? The teacher now 
are changing the way they are teaching. They're incorporating more of the people, more of the uh, assessment tools. And it's more conceptual than content. They're still, I mean, they're still grabbing the content. Yes, yeah. yeah. They're not releasing it a lot. You can see that the world is changing. It's mainly the those features that are doing very well. Nice. That's really nice to hear because I think you know there there is always that risk when you have this externally determined product that I, and I totally get it. You want your students to succeed, and and for some teachers they're in very high stakes environments themselves that you you know it you want to fall back, make sure they have all the content that they need. And but it is really nice to hear that um, that the design of the tasks is working, that it is supporting that concept driven teaching and learning. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is some of the resources that come from e-assessment because whether you use e-assessment or not, these can be really, really valuable. And these are actually things, having been in an MYP school myself who only did the personal project, I did not know about these resources. <laughs> and it's like, I've discovered so many things. I'm like, oh, I wish I knew about this when I was teaching. Um, so there are partially completed unit planners. Those are provided for the e-portfolio subjects, so currently language acquisition, um, personal health and health education, design, and arts. So for students who are participating in that e-portfolio, the teacher um, downloads this partially completed unit planner. They fill out the rest of it. They deliver that unit, do the assessment task, uh, standardize the assessment, and then it's submitted for moderation. Um, but that partially completed unit planner is on the PRC and available to anyone. So if you don't do e-assessment, you can still pull up this unit planner. They're posted twice per year, one for each assessment session. So if you want that as an example, if you want to just use that in your school, that's available. Um, there's pre-release material. This was the treasure trove that I just recently found out about. Um, for the interdisciplinary exam. Again, that's posted twice per year and it's available to everybody. Um, so if you need some ideas, if you need some materials for interdisciplinary teaching and learning, check that out. Um, the internal standardization is also gonna be something that all uh, year five schools will do for the personal project, but remember that it should be done in all subject areas at all grade levels. So that's a really great um, focal point for your faculty to work on standardization together so that when they meet in their subject teams or their grade teams they have a better understanding of that process. Uh, and then subject reports are issued at the end of every assessment session. Um, I'll show you an example in a second but that provides again really great advice and guidance and ideas for teachers when they come to designing their own tasks. So here's uh, just an example of internal standardization. If you haven't seen this video, which you might not have, it's buried in the coordinator support material. You have to go to the assessment policy page, which is kind of a strange place to put it. I'm working on changing that. Um, but it's a great video, not just about how to standardize, but why you should standardize. It's teachers talking about, you know, and it's lovely because they're honest about like, it was scary the first time I had to bring samples of my students' work for my colleagues to mark and to discuss, but they, they explain how it helped them to better understand what they needed to expect from their students and then how to prepare them for that. So that's a really helpful video. Um, it's not specific to the personal project, however, it's certainly relevant for personal project. And like I was just saying, um, personal project is a great opportunity to bring your faculty together to understand standardization so that when they go and do it in their subject specialist groups, they're just better prepared for that process. Um, there's also a webinar where personal project examiners go through objective by objective to mark a personal project, which I know that's assessment of the personal project has been a challenge and that's a really helpful resource to walk through that process. Um, these are the subject reports issued for every subject, every assessment session. Um, I used to write these as a moderator, and it, again, until then, I didn't know they existed. I'm like, this is super helpful. Um, there is a section that goes through criterion by criterion and talks about some of the typical issues they saw or challenges, which again, it's, it's specific to the assessment session, but these are, if, you know, if it's happening in the assessment session, these are probably challenges that are happening internally anyway, so really practical clarification about what those objectives are about. 
And then another section, that's fantastic, is the recommendation for teaching a future candidate. So this is your actionable feedback. This is how you can do better next time, not just in terms of moderation, but in terms of preparing students to meet these expectations. Um, the stimulus material, has anyone checked this out? Yeah, so this is for interdisciplinary, it's a treasure trove, it's on the PRC. So you can see this is just from the November 2018 exam. Um, I can't remember, I know it was mathematics and I think individuals and societies were the two subjects. Um, it's it's uh, all about online dating, online dating algorithms. You can see there's seven different resources available there for students to explore. The idea is that they get to check out these resources, the stimulus material in advance of the on-screen exam, and then they, they use what they, you know, they've got some ideas, they've had a chance to work with those materials, and then they go into the on-screen exam. Um, so you can see that's just um, one of the resources there is, is a video, another one is a Psychology Today article, I think there's a whole bunch of different resources. It's available in all the languages in which the ID exam is offered, so just a treasure trove of materials, a great starting point for your teachers if they're just not sure what to do. <laughs> this is kind of a one-stop shop. Here's the materials, um, here's some ideas of, about what you can do, and of course it's available whether you do the ID exam or not, and it's posted twice per year. Um, like I said, the partially completed unit planners also posted twice per year in the ePortfolio subjects. Um, you can basically just take that and use it, whether you're doing ePortfolio or not. Um, and just look at that list of resources. Um, so that's all available to all MYP schools. Really, really useful and great, um, especially when your teacher's like, I just don't know what this looks like. It gives them a really detailed picture. So we've heard about why school, and I you know, didn't need to tell you, you're engaged in it already, but we have ideas about why schools choose to do this. We've looked at how with some of those resources. Now I want to turn it back to you um, to share with each other to discuss, and I'm sorry, that is really difficult to read. I'll go, I'll go back to the other slides, because um, when we think about the impacts of e-assessment, those various benefits, um, how can we use, my question is how can we use the resources that are available to really enhance the benefits of those e-assessments? So whether you're using e-assessment or not, how can you really enjoy the benefits of that process? How can you transform teaching and learning, uh, deploy some of those resources that are available in order to make it as beneficial to your school, to your teachers, and to your students? So I'm going to put down the microphone. I'm going to hope that you'll sort of turn and chat with each other. Um, I think I will also try and zip back to. Um, I'm going to leave it on that slide. So just as the quick summary and reminder of what resources are available um, and connecting that to the d benefits or the outcomes that you'd like to see at your school.